So, elements of design. Elements of design are essentially the toolbox of options aesthetically. And aesthetics, what's that mean? That's a style of design or artwork. So that's a very important term that you need to know, aesthetic. So in terms of elements of design, it's your toolbox whereas, whereby you use these tools to achieve an overall fundamental soundness of your visual communication. Remember we covered principles of design, balance, emphasis, rhythm, and unity. Um, if you look up to the top left image here and you see uh, the large family by Rene Magritte, you see that it's a symmetrical balance, it's comfortable to look at, the emphasis is clearly stated in the center here based on size and center placement or space where it's located. It's um, high value versus dark value, so this comes forward, this sits back, this is the star of the show. So again, if you want balance, emphasis, rhythm, and unity, you use the elements of design. So let's get into it. Okay, color. And I do these in alphabetical order because I know that there's uh, seven terms and it makes it easier for me to remember. So color, the property possessed by an object of producing different sensations on the eye as a result of the way the object reflects or emits light. And we have hue, and hue is defined as pure color taken from the spectrum as seen in the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Remember Roy G. Biv when you were a little kid in elementary school? I think a lot of people were taught that. Primary colors here is red, blue, and yellow. Secondary colors, violet, green, and orange. And if you guys have a color wheel, you guys know that the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, if you mix them, you get the secondary colors, which is violet, green, and orange. Complementary colors. It's a color that combined with a given color makes white or black use this color to shade without black so another way in other words over here you see that you've got uh, God rest his soul you got Kobe's violet and his golden shirt if you want to make a darker tone of yellow say you're doing a piece of artwork and you want this yellow to be darker you would get a little bit of purple or violet and mix it with the purple or with the golden color here and it would shade it to a darker like you'd start to get some of these shades of the gold and likewise, or in, and vice versa, if you add gold to the violet here, it'll make this lighter and you get grays, okay? It's better than using black. Um, same thing here, you've got orange and blue, and the other one is green and yeah, uh, green and red, actually. So the way I remember these secondary, or I'm sorry, the complementary colors, the colors that will shade the colors is, um, the three combinations would be the Lakers, I always say the Denver Broncos or the New York Knicks in this case, orange and blue, or Christmas, red and green. Okay, saturation. That pertains to chroma or flakes of color that are mixed in to a color that's, uh, the more flakes of color that you have in a binder when you're talking about paint, the more chroma that you have, meaning you've got more color. It just comes out, it's deep, it's rich. Um, Think of a pomegranate, perhaps, where you get stained because it's a it's a it's a dye. Okay, so uh, that's what chroma is essentially. It's the deepness and the vibrancy of a color, and generally that's because there's more flakes of color mixed into the paint or the ink in that matter. Tint. Tint is any color that you add white to create a tint of that color, and vice versa. You add black to any color to shade the color. Say blue, you add black and you want it to be a navy blue, you'll get that. Okay, moving along. Line. Lines defined, it's a point moving in space. Line, maybe two or three dimensional, descriptive, implied, or abstract. So people always think of a line as, you know, putting your pencil tip down and dragging it and creating a straight line, but that's not what line is exactly. That's one aspect of line. But if you see here, your eye travels in a line from moon to moon to moon, from head to head to head. You can go back here and you can see the tree line. That's another form of line. The horizon line down here where the land meets the tree. Um, sunset's even creating a, a sort of a line. Okay, this particular line is called an implied line where it's like 
you get a repeating shape that guides your eye through the composition. Psychic line is like you see here with Iron Man where he's pointing his uh, repulsor ray at you. That is considered um, a psychic line and he's gazing at you too. This gaze is directing the viewer over here. That is a psychic line. A point or an arrow perhaps is also a psychic line. Okay, And again, line doesn't only have to be a single uh, pencil tip drag of, uh, of the graphite. Here you can see it might have been you know, somebody slamming down a charcoal pencil and having it crumble and then dragged it out to a point. But there's all kinds of texture and everything here, but that is a line. So these are the ones we're going to be covering all year. It's line, an implied line, meaning pattern that repeats, that gets your eye to go through the composition, or psychic line consisting of a point or a gaze. Notice if I have him flip the other way, your eye looked at him over here, and it would go right off the page. Okay. So the fact that this gentleman looking to the right here is looking at Iron Man helps to guide the eye, and that's what it does. Okay, moving on. Shape. Shape, the external form or appearance characteristic of someone or something. The outline of an area or figure. Okay, so this is my favorite building. This is the Chrysler Building in New York. And if you notice, it's got quite an exquisite shape based on the Art Deco of the 19, late 20s. Through the 1940s was its heyday, but you still get these happening. In fact, I just saw, I think it was a CVS that had just been remodeled, and it's got all the characteristics of an Art Deco aesthetic um, architecture. Shape. This is a 1930s era Corsair concept car. Boy, what a beautiful shape that is. And the shape is meant to draw your attention. The shape of a pelican. Look at how unusual this pelican's beak is. It serves a purpose. You know, form follows function. Um, and then this, I remember this got reported a few years ago and everybody was freaking out about this surfer that had a shark swim out in front of him. But if you look at this, that is the fin of a dolphin and this is a lateral fin. It's not a vertical fin on the back of the dolphin. And, you know, but this went around the world and everybody thought it was a near miss with a shark. So again, shape can be used to draw attention or emphasis. Size, the relative extent of something. A thing's overall dimensions or magnitude, how big something is. If you've ever been to the sequoias, you'll see that this is a, a pretty average sequoia tree. This is not the biggest I've seen, but you get a sense of scale based on size. Um, can't remember this character's name down here with the yellow background. What is that? Godzilla? And uh, you're getting a sense of scale right here to show more drama in the storytelling. I don't know where this is, I just recently found this, but look at that eyeball and these people to give yourself a sense of scale. And again, you can vary size, like you see over here on the left with the chick, you vary size to create interest because that's not something you see every day. How many people know about the atom in DC Comics? It was always interesting because he could shrink down to microscopic scale. I guess the equivalent of Marvel Comics would be um, Ant-Man. Going on to space. Here we go again, The Big Family by Rene Magritte. This is called A Spatial Puzzle, where he created a silhouette and he made an interior, which is an alternative reality. Okay, you've got peace and tranquility within, tumultuous storm outside of the silhouette in the form of a dove, which is uh, indicative of the Holy Spirit. Okay, symbols are everywhere. Pay attention. This is another Rene Magritte piece. I love his work because it's not in the same vein as Salvador Dali, which is borderline nightmarish, where you have elephants walking through the sky with legs that are stories and stories tall, like, what do they call those? People that are on um, stilts. So his are always painted in a normal way, and there's always like a little slice of dry humor, or everything is normal except for one little aspect, and you have to look for it. So this is a regular tree trunk, and imagine going to a tree trunk and opening it up and finding these things inside. That tells a story. John Ford, the famous director, used to utilize the southwest, specifically this area where these two mountains, these uh, rock structures are called the Mittens, are located. And these are iconic. When you think of Western movies, I personally will think of the Mittens all day long. And then we've got the master of spatial manipulation down here, M.C. Escher, where he's giving you these geese flying overhead that transmute into fish and the negative space, negative space transition. So space is something not to be taken lightly either.
Texture, the feel, appearance, or consistency of a surface or a substance. A tactile texture is something that you can actually touch literally and feel. Visual texture is what you're seeing in these instances where you see these spotted dolphins with all this beautiful camouflaging kind of a texture. Um, nothing happens in nature without a purpose. You've got the scales of this fish, and if you've ever caught a fish and some fish have just catch the light and the, the scales are just, they put on a show of beautiful color and you've got all this texture happening as well. You've got the poppies that we witnessed explode a couple years ago in California. That was a gorgeous sight and that creates a visual texture as well. And down here, one of my favorites looks like the feathers of a red tail hawk perhaps. So again, tactile is what you can touch. Visual is what you can see and that's what we have here. Can you guys think of any examples of tactile textures or maybe somebody did letter forms that they put a photograph of something inside the letters. And lastly, we've got value. Over the summer, I had a student that reached out and asked me about value and didn't realize that value also incorporates color too. It's about lightness and darkness. The difference between light and dark is how it's defined here. And again, light and dark can really push your composition to be clearly stated in terms of What's in the foreground it could be dark, and if it's dark in the foreground and bright in the background, you tend to look beyond the foreground to the background um, because the high value, warm color grabs people's eyes primarily, cold colors sit back. And so value in this instance, you've got Arthur Rackham right here, and this is a, a painting, or yeah, it's a watercolor having to do with the myth of, At of Atlas. And this is where Hercules came during his... Uh, his quest, he had these quests that he had to perform, and one of them was to take over for Atlas for a little while to give him a break. And this is an unusual depiction because normally you see the form of Atlas with the earth on his shoulders. And this one shows that he's holding up some sort of a canopy and Hercules is taking his spot. Um, he's taking a lot of liberties here, though, because if this is off in a distance on a mountaintop, I mean, and he's a regular, he's uh, a demigod, half man, half god in Greek mythology, but at this part right here, he's got to be really tall in comparison to the people in the foreground. But again, you see warm color here, cold color here. Warm colors come forward, cold colors sit back. Warm colors act like the loud person at the party, and cold colors, green, purple, and blue are the people that tend to hang on a wall and have a quiet conversation. Scale over here, light versus dark. You've got this beautiful uh, light versus dark, especially here in the center of the eye where you've got the pupil here with this highlight and you've got this definite fineness, this soft little indication for the eyelashes, but light and dark make that happen. You always want to shoot for high value, middle value, dark value with your work. This is the most circulated print in history. This is Maxfield Parish. This is called Twilight. And if you look this up online, it is so different from print to print to print. A lot of the time I'm seeing it now online where it's orange and violet and they make it out to be some sort of a warm sunset. But I've seen this painting in real life and this is what it looks like. It's got this beautiful aqua kind of a blue coloration here. And again, Maxfield Parrish was arguably top five most successful American illustrators in history. And he was one of the first people that realized you make a painting, you can sell it multiple times. And he did. He sold his for advertisements. He sold the original. He sold the rights to be made into posters and into calendars, uh, etc. So now we know that. I mean, now you can go to a program online. Society6 is one that I like to use. And I'll do an illustration and I'll put it on a shirt. I'll put it on a bag. I'll put it on a button. I'll make it into stickers and sell an image multiple times. And lastly, you've got this value down here, which is in the form of an etching. And this is Albrecht Dürer, who was an amazing, amazing Renaissance artist from Germany. And this, if you see the entirety of it, this is the holy Christian soldier. He's got a dog down here because in uh, Christian mythology, I wouldn't say Christian mythology. I would say that this is, you know, what we believe. God created horses and dogs. And uh, to me, they're there to give you comfort and to provide you companionship in your life. And this soldier is ignoring temptation and he's got a sand dial here indicating the termination of your life and this is the devil over here and this is this 
etching and was reproduced many times in print form. It was uh, created in the Renaissance period and recently um, was uncovered, an original was uncovered at uh, that pawn shop, the show Pawn Stars. They uncovered an original that paid a few thousand dollars for it and it's worth close to a hundred thousand dollars. So that's value for you, okay? The degree of darkness and lightness, all right? Hope you enjoyed that.